Deep in the heart of Java's remote villages, death gets skinned alive and sold for thousands of dollars. But first, let me tell you something that might surprise you. The global snake industry is worth over 1.2 billion annually. From ancient medicine to luxury fashion, these creatures that most people fear have quietly become one of the world's most valuable and controversial commodities. While the rest of the world sees snakes as harbingers of death and danger, in a small village nestled deep within Java's forests in Indonesia, these serpents are the very foundation of life itself, feeding families, powering local economies, and sustaining entire communities through generations. Here's what makes this story truly remarkable. These people don't run from snakes. They catch them with bare hands, kill them in cold water baths, and skin them with the precision of master tailors. Every part of the snake, from meat to skin, bile to venom, has value. Some skins, when they reach European markets, can sell for up to 4,000. You're about to enter a world where survival and death are separated by a single heartbeat. A world where every bite could be fatal, but every snake represents a chance to change your life forever. And what stunned us most wasn't how they killed these creatures. It was how they've transformed fear itself into a living heritage passed down through generations. But before we dive into this hidden world, let's explore the mysterious history that brought us here. In the red dirt regions of West Java, where winding paths snake between coconut groves and rice paddies, there exist villages unlike anywhere else on Earth. Here, people don't farm crops to survive. They don't raise livestock or fish the seas. They live by snakes, not toy snakes, not snake oil in supermarket jars. Real snakes, living snakes, venomous snakes, and pythons longer than a grown man's body. This is where our story takes an unexpected turn. Snake skinning here isn't just a trade, it's an art form. Gutting snakes is routine. Drawing entire carcasses for medicine is a skill passed from father to son. Children grow up beside snake skins drying on fences, feeling no fear, only curiosity. Because for them, snakes aren't nightmares, they're livelihoods. Unlike the Western world, where serpents are synonymous with evil and death, the people here view snakes through a purely practical lens. Every snake is an opportunity. A single snake skin can feed a family for a week. A large python can help them pay their children's school fees. There are no steel mills here, no dairy farms. What they have is the skill to hunt, kill, and process Asia's most dangerous creatures. While the rest of the world sees snakes as something to avoid, for these Indonesian villagers, snakes are something to embrace every single day. Early morning, when dew still clings to banana leaves and snakes are slithering back to their nests after a night of hunting, the men set out. They don't carry guns. What they bring is a dull knife, a mesh bag, and absolute composure. In West Java, snake hunting isn't for the faint of heart. This isn't sport hunting. This is survival. Every snake caught, whether a small water snake or a four-meter python, has value. And when your food money, rice money, and medicine money depend on one precise grab, death becomes less frightening than hunger. Professional snake hunters typically work in groups. They stretch nets through bamboo forests, set traps along rice field borders, and place baited hooks near stagnant pools. They know exactly where snakes travel, under fallen logs, through wild pineapple bushes, along damp creek beds. Comment one. If you find this video fascinating, comment zero if you find it boring. Many snakes are caught while coiled around tree trunks. Some are pulled from burrows, mouths still hissing, and sometimes being just one second too slow is enough to ensure the hunter never returns home. But it's precisely in this danger that snake hunting becomes an art form, where courage, experience, and yes, luck are measured in cold, hard cash.
At the snake processing center in Java, the pungent smell of blood mingles with kiln sook and the acrid odor of damp skin. Large metal drums filled with water mark the beginning of a cold processing chain that would make outsiders shudder. Snakes are dropped into these water drums while still alive. The reason? Local people believe that letting snakes die slowly in cold water causes less suffering, and more importantly, preserves the best skin quality. No tears, no bruising. But at about 20 minutes, when their bodies stop moving, the butchering begins. On worn wooden boards, each snake is laid out. The worker, with a knife just long enough, cuts along the belly, precise to every vertebra. The skin is peeled away in intact sections, pulled from head to tail, an operation that only those who've done it thousands of times can perform so smoothly. Meat and organs are sorted immediately. Snake bile, the most precious part, is collected in glass bottles, numbered, and sent straight to traditional medicine quarters. No modern machinery, no automated conveyor belts, everything by hand, by habit, by survival instinct. But here's where it gets controversial. In this very precision, Many Western observers question whether this is traditional craft or commercialized torture disguised as trade. After skinning, the still damp snakeskins are hung on drying racks under the tropical sun. Others are taken to salt water baths, then scrubbed clean by hand. Each scale is meticulously processed to prevent flaking or discoloration, because just one small flaw could cost hundreds of dollars. Skins that meet standards are then laid flat, rolled up, labeled, ready for the journey to leather workshops in Jakarta, Bangkok, and from there to Europe. When they reach Milan or Paris, they're no longer rough, blood-scented hides. They're dyed, polished, embossed, and transformed into handbags, high heels, wallets, belts, bearing the names of major fashion brands like Gucci, Hermes, and Prada. A snakeskin, when it's still drying on a village fence, is worth only a few dozen dollars. But when it's displayed behind glass in a luxury store on the Champs-Élysées, its price can reach 4,000 USD. This creates a fascinating paradox. From a reptile feared and killed in water drums, the snake is reborn a second time on the shoulders of high society, a quiet but familiar contradiction. What's despised in one place is admired in another. While snakeskin travels to Europe to enter the world of luxury fashion, the remaining meat returns to exactly where it was born. Village markets, small eateries, family kitchen fires. In many rural areas of Indonesia, snake meat isn't an exotic delicacy, it's daily bread. For people here, snakes are considered high-protein, low-fat food that's no less nutritious than chicken or fish. And more importantly, easy to find, cheap, and available year-round. Experienced housewives skillfully clean snake meat, cut it into small pieces, marinate it with garlic, ginger, lemongrass, then grill it over charcoal or stew it with lime leaves and hot peppers. This dish has a unique aroma, rich flavor, with meat that's chewy like free-range chicken, but with finer, sweeter fibers. Some places also make dried snake meat, like beef jerky, for long-term storage or as snacks. Additionally, snake bile, extracted separately during butchering, is often soaked in alcohol and drunk as a tonic. Especially among village men, who believe drinking snake bile enhances vitality, fights fatigue, and increases endurance for labor. In the West, snakes never appear on dinner tables. But in Indonesia, they're what literally raise entire poor generation. Not all snakes are immediately skinned, processed, and eaten. Some, especially smaller snakes or those not completely intact, are kept whole, coiled into circles, and placed in, in drying ovens. After 24 hours in the heat, these snake carcasses is hardened like wood, maintaining their spiral shape. They're no longer food. They've become precious ingredients in traditional medicine, especially in Chinese medicine, Vietnamese medicine, and native Indonesian healing practices. In Eastern medical philosophy, 
Dried snakes dispel wind, reduce pain, and open blood vessels. They're ground into powder, boiled for extract, or soaked in alcohol to treat conditions like joint pain, mild paralysis, numbness in hands and feet, and weakness after serious illness. Besides this, special parts like snake bile, venom, and bones are all collected, carefully preserved, and sold to folk medicine shops. Bile is stored in small glass bottles, sealed and sold at prices many times higher than meat. Here's something most people don't know. While many know snake venom is used to make anticoagulant drugs in modern medicine, few realize that for hundreds of years, snakes have been part of East Asian folk medicine treasures as medicine from the shadows. What once spread fear in jungles, humans now use to heal themselves. If snakes are the common livelihood of Javanese farmers, then pythons, especially adults, are considered portable treasure. An adult python can weigh up to 90 kg, stretch over six meters with a body as thick as an adult's thigh. They're not easy to hunt, but once captured, each python skin can be worth up to 10,000 USD if processed with proper technique. At specialized facilities in Indonesia, pythons are brought into steel cages kept alive to serve a controversial process. Pumping water into their bodies while still living, helping the skin stretch, making it easier to remove, and reducing tears during processing. This is the stage most criticized by animal protection organizations. But for people here, it's the only way to achieve high commercial quality. Python skin after removal is washed clean, soaked in softening chemicals, then placed in large drying ovens. Afterward, they're dyed according to requirements, jet black, blood red, golden yellow, to serve the global high-end fashion industry. The entire process is done by hand, by skilled craftsmen whose hands are thick with scars and experience passed from father to son. Every knife cut, every incision, must be precise to the millimeter. Python skin isn't just luxury material, it's a symbol of craftsmanship in a handicraft industry surviving in the age of automation. In many places around the world, snakes symbolize danger. But in West Java, they symbolize hope and employment. It's estimated that Indonesia's snake processing industry currently provides direct employment for over 175,000 workers, along with about 150,000 hunters and farmers specializing in snake breeding. These numbers aren't just statistics. They represent families with food, children going to school, elderly people with medicine, in villages specializing in snake catching, the trade passes from generation to generation. Adults teach children how to set traps, how to identify venomous snakes, not to kill, but to survive and exist in a profession full of risks. But behind this lies an undeniable dark side. The increasing exploitation of wild snakes poses risks to biodiversity decline. Controversies surrounding the killing and processing of snake skins continue to simmer. Between the thin line of handicraft artistry and cruel behavior. And then, over-dependence on a single income source also makes many communities vulnerable to market fluctuations. A pandemic, a trade ban, or a wave of international opposition could bring everything crashing down in months. But for people here, snakes aren't a choice. They're all they have. In a world where the wealth gap grows daily, there are places where killing snakes is the only way to keep living. We've journeyed into a world where ancient wisdom meets modern necessity, where fear transforms into livelihood, and where the line between survival and exploitation remains razor thin. The snake industry of Indonesia reveals something profound about human adaptability and the complex relationship between tradition and progress. These communities have turned one of humanity's oldest fears into a sophisticated economic system that supports hundreds of thousands of lives. But this story raises questions that extend far beyond snakeskin and bile. In our interconnected world, who decides what's ethical? When survival is at stake, how do we balance animal welfare with human need? 
And as global markets increasingly demand transparency, how do traditional industries adapt while preserving their cultural heritage? The villagers of West Java don't see themselves as part of a global controversy. They see themselves as inheritors of ancient knowledge, skilled craftsmen, and providers for their families. Their relationship with snakes is neither romantic nor cruel. It's practical, respectful, and essential. As we return to our comfortable lives, far from the red dirt roads and drying snake skins, perhaps the most important question isn't whether we approve of their methods. Perhaps it's whether we truly understand the complexity of survival in a world where choices are luxuries not everyone can afford. The serpent's gold continues to flow from Java's villages to the world's fashion capitals, carrying with it stories of tradition, survival, and the eternal human struggle to transform fear into hope. What do you think? Share your thoughts in the comments below. And if you want to continue exploring the hidden stories behind the products we use every day, don't forget to subscribe. Every subscription and comment motivates us to keep telling these real stories from places few people can access. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.